From a vicious linebacker known as the Enforcer, to a Detroit Lion often called one of the greatest running backs ever, these superstars had all the talent an athlete could dream of, but it still wasn't enough to play on the NFL's biggest stage. Part of the original Seattle Seahawks roster in 1976, and a member of the team until the very end of the 1980s, Steve Largent was one of the most reliable wide receivers of his generation. A seven-time Pro Bowl selection elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Largent's stats placed him at the top of a list of all wide receivers from both his era and NFL history. In a 14-season career, Largent ranked among the top 10 players in receptions nine times, and in receiving yards and touchdown receptions eight times each. In other words, he was one of the most consistently performing wide receivers for well over a decade. He's also one of just 10 wide receivers named to the NFL's 100th anniversary team. I forgot to tell him about my hands. And he's got great hands. The only thing that really held back Largent during his years of bringing attention to the Seahawks and delighting appreciative Seahawks fans, he played for the Seahawks. As a team, they couldn't get it together in the 70s and 80s, usually finishing a season at just above 500 and making the playoffs only four times during Largent's tenure. In football, a sport where devastating injuries are the norm, Tony Gonzalez almost never missed a game. In a 17-year career with the Kansas City Chiefs and Atlanta Falcons, the tight end missed just two regular season games. And when he did play, he made major contributions to his team's offense, ranking in the top 10 in receptions five times, finishing at number three on the all-time list, and in 2007, breaking the receptions record for tight ends. Gonzalez also landed on the Pro Bowl squad a staggering 14 times during his career. When he retired, Gonzalez had racked up 1,325 successful catches, second only to Jerry Rice. Upon his first shot at eligibility for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, number 88 was inducted and also named to the organization's All-2000s team. But catches don't always lead to a team scoring the most touchdowns in the most games. Gonzalez's time in Kansas City was a mediocre era for the Chiefs. They made it to the postseason three times in 12 years with Gonzalez, and lost in early rounds all three times. His three playoff appearances with the Falcons proved equally fallow, and Gonzalez never got to suit up for the Super Bowl. Dick Buckus is the very mold of the ultra-tough, unstoppable, vicious linebacker. Nicknamed the Enforcer, he played for the Chicago Bears from 1965 to 1973 and still holds league records in recovered fumbles in a single season and in a career. The two-time Defensive Player of the Year was selected to eight Pro Bowls, as well as the NFL's 100th anniversary team. Butkus also made the NFL's all-decade teams for both the 1960s and the 1970s. One of the main reasons that Butkus never got to play in the Super Bowl was because the big interleague championship game between the AFL and the NFL didn't become a regular thing until the late 1960s, by which point Butkus was winding down his long and storied career. The Rose Bowl, as it turned out, was the only major postseason game I participated in in my whole football career. In Buckus's Super Bowl eligible years for the Chicago Bears, his team fared poorly, finishing with a 1 13 record at worst and a 6 8 record at best. A 2,000 yards rushing season is an exceedingly rare achievement for a running back. It's only happened eight times in NFL history, and in 1997, Detroit Lions star Barry Sanders did it rushing for 2,053 yards. He's also the only player to appear twice in the top 10 all-time individual season rushing yards list. In 1994, he amassed 1,883 yards. Altogether, Sanders led the NFL in rushing and yards per game four times in those 10 years, and he was named to the Pro Bowl every single time. CBS Sports called his 1997 campaign, in which he was voted the NFL's best player by the Associated Press and the Sporting News, the greatest ever for a running back. Sanders cruised into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2004. One accomplishment that escaped Sanders, a Super Bowl ring, or even an appearance. His Detroit Lions reached the postseason five times on the strength of Sanders' performances, but they couldn't go all the way. The farthest they got was the 1991 NFC title game in which Washington blew out Detroit 41-10. The NFL of the 1980s and 1990s was a big era for quarterbacks, so much so that a few teams took repeat trips to the Super Bowl because of their strong-armed defensive captains, one of the few QBs who could give those legends a run for their money when they were all at the height of their careers was Warren Moon. After five years in the Canadian Football League, Moon entered the NFL in 1984 with the Houston Oilers and served late career stints with the Minnesota Vikings, Seattle Seahawks, and Kansas City Chiefs. He was an architect of the comeback, leading 25 fourth-quarter come-from-behind victories with 35 game-winning late drives. The nine-time Pro Bowl selection retired in 2000, but remains the all-time franchise leader in 16 offensive categories for the Houston Oilers, now the Tennessee Titans. Moon led his teams to postseason berths seven times, but they never made it so far as a conference championship game. 
teams feared the Los Angeles Rams in the 1960s because of its imposing and intense defensive line nicknamed the Fearsome Foursome, led by 6'5", 272-pound defensive end David Deacon Jones. The NFL didn't keep official or precise track of sacks before the 1982 season, but knocking down the opposing team's quarterback before he even had a chance to throw the ball was Jones' specialty. He led the NFL in sacks five times in the 1960s, with as many as 22 per season on two occasions, averaging nearly one per game across his entire 14-season career. He also scored more than the usual defense-only defensive player, scoring an ultra-rare safety in 1965 and 1967 while leading the NFL in that stat both times. Named to the NFL's 100th anniversary team and the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Jones participated in seven consecutive Pro Bowls, despite playing for a lackluster Los Angeles Rams, followed by short late career stints in San Diego and Washington. During Jones' years in LA, the Rams made the playoffs twice, but didn't win a game, let alone a Super Bowl. Another standout member of the Los Angeles Rams' fearsome foursome defensive line, Merlin Olsen. Olsen spent his entire 15-year career in the 1960s and 1970s with the Rams, during which time he was voted to 14 Pro Bowls and won the 1974 Burt Bell Award for Best Player in the NFL, while he later went over a whole new generation of fans as an NBC sports commentator and actor, playing gentle characters on rural period pieces Little House in the Prairie and Father Murphy. Olsen was a frightening 6'5", 270-pound lineman. They do not have any identification. How do people know who you are? I tell them. A member of both the College Football Hall of Fame, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and the NFL's 100th anniversary team, Olsen has been well-recognized for his list of accomplishments. Not on that list, a Super Bowl ring. Olsen's Rams may have been notorious for their defensive lines, but they could barely scrape together a winning record. When he did reach the postseason, it ended in disappointment. He and the Rams lost three consecutive NFC Championship games from 1974 to 1976. Immediately upon his entry into the NFL, two-time collegiate All-American running back Eric Dickerson laid the groundwork for a career that would eventually lead to his enshrinement in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Dickerson put on one of the greatest all-time rookie performances, topping the leagues for rushing attempts and rushing yards. He'd get more rushing yards than anyone else in the NFL in three more seasons and finish with more than 13,000 placing Dickerson among the top 10 most prolific running backs ever. He routinely collected awards for his regular play, including three Offensive Player of the Year nods from the UPI, an AP Offensive Player of the Year award, and five All-Pro selections. And yet, in his historic 12-year career, Dickerson's teams only reached the postseason five times, his first five years. Neither the Los Angeles Rams nor Indianapolis Colts could get any farther than the second round of the playoffs, denying Dickerson a chance to run a Super Bowl touchdown. Gail Sayers' NFL playing career was decidedly short, spanning just five full seasons in the late 1960s, and entirely with the Chicago Bears. But the running back put up such consistently high and dazzling numbers that it earned him entry into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and a slot on the NFL's 100th anniversary team. His 1965 and 1969 seasons alone featured some of the best stats ever put up by a running back. In the former, he rushed for 1,231 yards, and in the latter, he rushed for 1,032 yards. Named the NFL's top offensive rookie by the Associated Press, UPI, and Sporting News, Sayers was a high school track star, which gave him the speed and moves he needed to zip past linemen, according to the AP. One of the most effective and unstoppable kick returners, Sayers once returned from a potentially career-ending knee injury to lead the league in rushing. Sayers' era just barely overlapped with the NFL's early stabs at the Super Bowl, and he never got to play in one. The number one pick in the 1978 NFL Draft, Earl Campbell came to the NFL with a lot of hype a Heisman Trophy winner, and a consensus All-American. The running back delivered. In 1978, he earned Rookie of the Year as well as the NFL's MVP award for the first of four seasons, in which he'd lead the AFC in rushing yards and yards per game. In 1980 alone, he amassed what was at that point the second most yards ever in a season, including four straight 200-yard games. Having never even gotten the opportunity to win a Super Bowl is the one thing that rattled Campbell. Even more than three decades after he retired after the 1985 season, he told the Houston Chronicle in 2017, There are times I wish I had a Super Bowl ring. For a Hall of Famer, that's one thing that sums up your career, having a Super Bowl ring. Campbell figures the Oilers could have made a run in the early 1980s under coach Bum Phillips. He told the Houston Chronicle, But they fired Bum, and that broke the nucleus of the way we approached the game and the way we felt about the game. As such, Campbell and the Oilers made it as far as the AFC title game in 1978 and 1979, 
blown out both times by the Pittsburgh Steelers, 